Namaste and welcome to another episode of the Vichar Mantan podcast, a project looking to explore dharmic ideas and discuss this with people all over the world. We are very excited today to bring back Judy Ling Wong to the platform. She was born in Hong Kong, she studied in Australia and has since been living in Europe. She's a painter, a poet and an environmentalist. And she's also known as the honorary president of the Black Environment Network. Today, we'll talk about all things to do with building our green future. What are some of the challenges that society faces today? What do humans need to do to get out of whatever problems we're facing? What does a sustainable society look like? And how we go about building a green future for ourselves and for our future generations. Judy Ling Wong, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. Looking forward to this. Definitely. Uh, um, I think we're looking forward to it too. And thank you again for joining us, right? Um, you were not too long ago on a Jar Month and Fireside. How was that? It was always interesting for me to advance into approaching a different audience, speaking with people with different viewpoints. I like that very much. And, and that's amazing. I love to do that too. Um, hosting this podcast has enabled us to reach out to people far and wide. And especially for me personally, right? getting on a phone call with someone who's a specialist matter expert in something in their field from from all over the world and our audience is quite diverse too i was just looking at some of the 2021 stats and i just want to say thanks to those that are listening from all over the world it's amazing we're in like 27 different countries um, and with thanks to judy hopefully we'll be sharing this content with people far and wide further um judy so you have been in many parts of the world. Would you say any of those shaped your view on what the world is? Absolutely. I lived in three very different cultures, three very different environments before I was 25. So I lived in, in the Chinese culture when I was born in Hong Kong for the first 15 years of my life. And then in my formative years, and this is very important because I wasn't fully formed when I was only 15, I went to Australia and was exposed to a completely different culture with a very, very fantastic landscape of brilliant sunshine and wide open spaces and so on. And I came into a very crowded Europe, you know, with so many countries side by side in a small space and culturally, again, completely different. And then finally settled down in London, which at that time, you can say was an aspect of Europe, especially if you see it in world terms, but a very different island mentality. That's so interesting to hear. You, you really are from all over the world. And do you think, or have you felt a common thread through all of these cultures? Well, if you look at this spiritually, the common thread that is that we are evolutionally on a kind of journey together. And especially in Buddhist culture and, and so on, we talk about the individual spiritual journey as being enmeshed with the collective spiritual journey. So that especially with climate change nowadays, it has hit home really hard that we cannot move forward, any of us on our own. So this is obviously a topic that's quite uh, close to your heart. And for our audience, Judy has, has pioneered uh, an integrative approach to environmental participation, uh, bringing together social, cultural, environmental and economic concerns. Judy, why is something like that important to you? First of all, I'd like to thank the nature conservationists because without them, there wouldn't be an environmental movement at all. But what is commonly known as the environmental movement is driven by pe people who love green nature, all about animals and forests and beautiful landscapes and, and so on and so on. But it is no longer enough. We have to think of all sorts of dimensions that are also environmental and in a way reclaim the word environment. 
After all, the green environmental sector has run away with that word environment. Once upon a time, you go and look in the dictionary when you say environment, it means everything around you, your buildings, your your people, everything. But nowadays, when you say environment, people immediately think green. But we have to return to that holistic approach in order to rescue ourselves. We need to think of energy, how we build our buildings, absolutely everything. That is so interesting because you're right. Environment does mean everything around you. What, what's happened there? Have we exported the problems? Or rather, we, we talk of environment as something outside of the, the busy city in which we live. You know, we need to take care of the environment. It's that, you know, it's the forests and it's the parks and it's the deer. It's not, oh my God, I'm having like a brainwave here. How do we build our buildings? What materials are we using? How sustainable is society? Very often at a conference, I would do this little exercise with people. Say, let's, we, let's say we're in a conference in London. I would say to them, let's look at what is on your table. You've got a glass of water. If the water is actually local, you are actually drinking the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. Because the vapor rises out of the, the sea, goes very high, and when it hits the cold air, and so it drops down this rain on whales mainly, <laughs> but it is the Atlantic Ocean. If you're holding in a glass, glass is made of sand. Before you know it, you can see the beach. And if you are sitting there and carpet is under your feet, if there's any wool in it, you're standing on the flock of sheep. And if you're in a concrete building, guess where it all comes from? The mountains, the rocks, everything. You're in a cave. Before you know it, you can see that the door, if it's got wood in it, you have the forest beside you. You are forever living in a landscape. You cannot escape. I'm, I'm beaming here because that's poetic almost um you literally painted the picture for me that is a great great little exercise <laughs> and it's so true even your clothes you are wrapped in animals and plants we are literally the universe oh my god you see when you think like that it, it's what people call deep ecology when you actually understand that even the most technical things like the microphone I see in, in front of you and so I'm made out of metal and so on, everything around us, everything we use and touch is ripped out of the earth. So that when we think of green nature and so on and losing, it's symbolic of that, but basically absolutely everything is, is Mother Earth itself. So suddenly you look outside your window and see all these buildings and hard materials and so on, and you see it as a natural landscape. Yeah. And then it becomes important about how we're, and the way you put it, ripping it from earth. Is there a better way to take and share and be a part of the journey? Like, I, I really like how you've extended almost, and literally mother nature, living energy, living force as, even these inanimate walls, right? There and and this is this is so interesting. You know, we we say we say that there's God in everything, or there's there's light in everything, there's energy in everything, and it's very hard to comprehend that when you're talking about a wooden table or a metal microphone, until you break it down to that. That it's come from the natural elements. We as man, as humanity, have used I don't know our intelligence to create and put these things together and. So when you do see that skyscraper in central London, that's literally come from the elements from the earth. Oh, man. Yes, and that is why that is also showing you our power. That is yeah? amazing. The power of human beings being able to manipulate elements of nature and why we have environmental damage is out of our own ingenuity. We've become so advanced technically that we're moving faster than Mother Earth. Now, you need to understand that nature can heal itself mm, infinitely. Mm, I do believe that. And, and um, everything you damage, it will begin to heal. But the problem now is we've gone past the point of the pace of healing. 
we're damaging it faster than it can heal itself. It's still constantly doing that, but it's not fast enough because of the mass damage that we are doing by taking too much and disturbing the whole system in a way that is healing very slowly and we're damaging it very fast. So we as humans are now no longer in harmony, we're not balanced with Mother Nature. Do you think we once were? We were once weak, you know, and we couldn't manipulate all, all sorts of things. For example, if you look at the, the previous centuries, so-called balance of nature and people living in, in landscapes and so on, part of that formula of balance was human death. Wow. Now that we have medical science, literally, we are not allowed to die. It, yeah, it's true. And we're forever looking for ways to extend this life that we have. But at what cost? Yeah, this is interesting. We have a duty to Mother Earth to give it back what we take from it. I get, I, essentially, once this body is gone, it returns to the elements. Various traditions around the world have ceremonies after one's death in which they do. And um, from Sanatan Dharma, from the Hindu civilization, thousands of years, you know, you, you cremate the body. And so that ash goes back in. And then actually you, some people will take those ashes to a holy river and, and deposit them there through a, a, a thorough ceremony. You know, so many elements that come together to make that happen. And what you've just said there um, about we have become stronger and we're manipulating the world in different ways. I work in IT. My whole world has been about technology. And I, you know, I can explain, I can write in binary. I understand ones and zeros and how that construct is made. But what are we really doing? We're manipulating the element that is silicon and we're, we're bashing it together. You know, a CPU processor inside a computer. Like, what is it that makes a computer churn and chip and turn away and come to life, so to speak, is our man manipulation of that silicon. And the way you've put it for other things, like, okay, with wood, we've made furniture and desks and things. So man is doing all sorts of things to the elements around it. Think of the hydrogen collider, where we're bashing together fundamental atoms. And I don't even know, how, how do you tell that all is? Well, it's a wonderful world. You see, the tragedy that we are actually sensing at the moment is a misuse of our ingenuity. Right. And a lot of science is being distorted. For example, instead of using science to understand what we need to do, how to control what we do need to do, what not to damage, what to take care of and so on. We damage it all first and then we need to, we use science to fix it. Yeah, then we have to use of science. Then we have to measure have, our carbon footprint. Yeah, we need to control what we do respect the beauty and ultimately understand that although we have all this ingenuity true power lies with mother nature she will destroy us as we can see you know you can mess about with all these things but she throws you a storm and you're completely helpless that's sometimes what i think about you know when we have like a tsunami it's like that raw power of mother nature the the seas the land whatever is going on at such a detailed level is just coming to wash away and you know we think we think things have gone wrong because a, a city or a village has been swept under and of course that's you know human life has been taken but you know this world isn't promised to us almost we are a part of its fabric and our living and breathing and dying and all the animals and elements in between that also go through that living and dying are a part of the story. How old is, is Mother Earth? Do we know? Billions of well, years. We're part of the history of the cosmos. So you can, you can say that our beginnings lie way, way further than we think. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? We're, we're always living in the present and so on. But if you're privileged to see the night sky, which we're not in London because there's too much light even at night, but if you look at the night sky, you know, all the things you're seeing is in terms of light years. You're actually not looking at the present, you're looking at the past. By that time, the, the stars and so many things so far where it actually reaches your eyes, the image is of its past. You know, so, so we're, we're living in very, very incredible times. 
And I, I would like to, to say that we must need to begin to reclaim that true power of life, which can also lie in our hands with our ingenuity, through controlling what we do and being very serious about how we shape the earth to be a marvelous future, a green future, which we are being forced to look at at the moment because of what is facing us in terms of storms and wildfires and so on. We can work with Mother Nature and have a fabulous life. That sounds amazing um, and almost utopic. So Judy, in uh, something like 20 years ago, you were honored with an OBE for pioneering ethnic minority environmental participation uh, and then in 2007, a CBE for Services to Heritage. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? When we first started Black Environment Network, there wasn't a single organization in the mainstream environmental sector that even thought about ethnic minorities. And yet, even then, there were massive numbers of us concentrated in the cities of the UK. So some of us got together and said, this is wrong. We should be part of it. We want to be part of it. So we began to, to develop this idea of what we call the multicultural environmental participation. We say there are two things. Firstly, we have the right to the environment, which is the beautiful thing. And many people didn't even know where the beautiful places were, the nature reserves, the national parks and so on. And many of us lived in very bleak urban areas and suffered a lot without nature. And then the other side of it, of course, is once we in contact and part of the environmental movement, we ourselves are releasing a vast missing contribution. So that was carrot and cake there you know, alongside the other things, having a stick saying, saying to the environmental organizations, hey, you're not doing something you should be doing. But at the same time, we say, if you do this, you're going to release a fast missing contribution into the movement, which you will love too. And of course, a journey is very rich instead of just being mechanical about it. We were also talking about how as we come into the environmental sector, we come with different cultural visions of nature, For sure. which are rich and beautiful, oh, yeah. much more rich and beautiful than some of the very bleak scientific views of nature. And these bleak scientific views, they've only been around for like 100, maybe yeah. 200 years. And this esoteric, this ancient wisdom you speak of, how long ago are we able to trace? We're talking about thousands of years yes yes tens yes. of thousands of years yes tried and tested methods for humanity yes. to survive yes. and be sustainable and live in harmony with nature so and very rich you know a lot of things in the west are now too too intellectualized you know everything has to be understood and everything has to be laid out and analyzed. There are lots of things that cannot yet be laid out and analyzed, like music, all kinds of sound that you use in ritual and so on, which when you hear them, it echoes in the depths of your being because it's true and real. And I always say to people, do not forget, you know, that science is always behind reality. It's only telling you what reality is. And even at the most cutting edge of, of reality and science, it has not yet got to the center of what reality is. It's always behind. Yeah. It's just a small window of understanding that we've, you know, a bunch yes. of frameworks, something we were able to yes. measure. And we call it a science. Of course, there are very sophisticated sciences out there, quantum physics, et cetera, et cetera. But it's brilliant what you're saying. Reality is actually far far way ahead, ahead. Far it's always ahead. ahead and i have i have had very interesting friendships for example i knew sir john vane who won the nobel prize in chemistry he's passed away now but i i knew him because i was friends with his daughter and uh once we were talking about the image of science as very exact very bleak and so on and he was quite cross about it. he says you know this is the fault of the applied scientists you know, where, where all the things have been discovered. So you sit there and you, you look at all the formulas and you use them and all that stuff. But he says the true scientists are like poets because they have to go into the unknown. They have to use their imagination 
bring back something and then anchor it in reality before you can actually use it as the latest piece of invention. So he says that all the creativity is that, he says all progress of any kind is poetic and imaginative. Brilliant. To all the creators out there, to all of those that are listening, you've got something deep inside you, pull it from the Kashik record, dig it out of your mind's grave. <laughs> and bring it into reality don't worry too much about the science and the mechanics and the explaining it to people if people understand it or not there is such rich sciences that come from thousands of years of heritage um take any of the cultural ancients right no you see it i mean even some of our great scientists like the discovery of of the shape of dna and so on they saw it in dream and these were western scientists yeah, even things like gravity and, you know? and stuff like that, you know. The, yeah, the, the and claims, movement of inspiration. The, the, the claims are made that it was discovered in Europe somewhere in the last 500 or, or 1,000 years. But humans have been around for so much longer. I've discovered all things to do with astronomy and the planets and cellular structures and surgery and th things like how beauty come into society, like at a very human level of academia. Um, the ancient universities of India, for example, there were so many. Wow. Absolutely. I, I could go off on forever about things like this, and I'm sure there's so much that you could say, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's bring it in. Let's whittle it down a little bit. So humans are facing challenges. What, what are our top five challenges, Judy? Could you help us with that? Well, our top challenge, of course, as you know, is, is CO2, right. the emission of CO2, which we all know about now, we all talk about net zero and zero carbon and so on. Carbon because footprint. once you once you re release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it will stay there for between 300 to 1000 years. So for example, a lot of developing countries say, you are calling us the culprits, you're calling China the biggest emitter, India and so on. They say, hang on a minute. If we look at who has emitted that is still up there historically, you lot in Europe has had your industrial revolution and put all the carbon into the air. And now that we are beginning to progress in the develop developing world, you're telling us not to do it and give up our industrial revolution so we don't put any more into the air. Well, we think this is wrong. And if you want to do, do it with the whole world, then you need to pay us to do it. This is the big argument going on. I it's not it. really an argument. It is a, it's a taking of responsibility and also recognizing that how can you ask poorer countries to pay for very expensive new technology when they're already struggling, when the Western world has so much more money and doing lots of things that it does not need to do in order to have a good life. Like going into space. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, all the super rich is another problem. What the super rich do is you say, the, the very small numbers of super rich people, the emissions from flying, they, in that very small number, emit 50% of it. You've just, you've just opened my eyes, Judy. This is amazing what you're saying. You know, the West had their industrial revolution. And now that the poorer countries are trying to have theirs, there's this big setback. Oh, hold on a minute, CO2, yeah, but what about yours? Brilliant, brilliant. That is, that is definitely a movement I could support. Um, this, is, this is gold dust, I love this. And what, you're, what we're also saying is that these poorer nations are trying to develop and take on the responsibility of their carbon emissions in a more sustainable way. There's a huge problem. There's a huge problem. I tell you what the problem is. If only we had been more astute to what is happening, listening to scientists about climate change earlier, we wouldn't be in this very terrible mess because we've been talking about it for 30 years. We've now come to this critical moment where we are, we are faced with if we go over 1.5 degrees increase in temperature, we're going to hit absolute catastrophe. Now, a lot of people still don't understand this 1.5 degree this was a big scenario. theme. Shall I explain it a little? Definitely. And, and this was a, a big theme at COP26 just recently, right? 
it's not just a big theme just because we want it. It's a big theme because it's a reality of catastrophe. What it is that is that Mother Nature is incredibly sensitive. You only have to shift the, the usual temperatures by fractions of a degree and everything changes. You now see in the UK, for example, very simple things that like you go into your garden. In December, the roses are still flowering. Yeah. Mm. Instead of just flowering in summer, they're now flowering in December. And also, so all the mechanisms of nature shift with tiny fractions of temperature instead of the seasons being stable and so on, everything is being destabilized. So what is happening phenomenally is that one of the critical things is our harvest. This is all about food for one thing. So when you shift the temperature like that, and what is already, ha already happening now is that the plants and so on, they grow faster they also grow faster because there's more CO2 in the air. So, you know, lots of trees, they take in CO2 right. as part of their, their building blocks of growing and lots of plants. They're growing too fast. And the other thing that's happening to food plants is that the nutritional value falls with the temperature increase. Right. And the other thing that is happening with seeding and many of our food is grain, you know, wheat and rice and all that and so on the seeding process decreases with the rising temperature. So the percentage harvest is falling with the rising temperature. This is really, really critical. They think that with 1.5 and so on, you, have, you can have something like losing 33% of the harvest. You just think, oh my God, you, you know, what does this mean? I mean, especially if you look at countries with big land masses and so on, and they're exporting food and all that, a country like the UK with its tiny islands and so on, we can't even feed ourselves on our land mass. Most of our food, 50% is imported. Can you imagine if the chaos of feeding the world comes upon us, what will happen? This is something very fundamental. And of course, all the phenomena that is also affecting Thing, agriculture in particular and so on, like drought and flooding and so on all over the world. We have only seen the beginning of it. What do you think then about food that's grown inside, like, like grow farms, like vertical farming? Well, it is a matter of scale. If you think you can do it, but I don't think it will be, be um, very tasty. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to try it out. Has anybody got any lab-grown tomatoes? Let's spend... <laughs> Let's have a go. Yeah, if you if you even buy your vegetables from an organic farm that nurtures its soil and so on, and compare it to the taste of some of these greenhouse grown carrots and so on, which taste carrots that taste like you know coloured water basically. Right, and you they can have no we, taste. humans have begin to manipulate that level of the growth of tomatoes. I don't know. We've been cloning sheep and doing all sorts for years. Lots of challenges. Well, they actually say that they say that nutritionally, you know, the nutritional value of a tomato just after the war, you now have to eat thirty tomatoes to eat to be equivalent to the nutritional value of that once upon a time tomato. This is terrible. That that is a catastrophe. Are you telling me that food was much more nutritious before? Am I just naive yeah, because... not to know that? Because, because all the elements were in the soil. We're now bleaching the soil. Firstly, we overuse it. We want more and more food, and then most of it we throw away. When we throw it away, we don't bring it back to the earth. We just throw it away. So a lot of the food we grow nowadays is in the empty soil structure, and we pour fertilizers and chemicals on it. Not that you're painting the bleak picture, but we've seriously got this wrong. Yeah, and pesticides. We're full of chemicals that are, are from pesticides as well. At the moment, they are fighting for pesticides that might kill all our bees. There are, okay, clearly, clearly humans are out of balance, out of touch with nature. What can we do to fix this? What's our, where do we begin? Well, 
you know, as I said, we are so ingenious. It's actually, we can face a very beautiful and very wonderful future. First of all, we are ingenious. But secondly, one of the things we increasingly realize is that we live in a world and we need to care for each other. And I always talk about the, the two pillars of sustainable development. The two pillars of sustainable development are two key relationships. It's the relationship of people to nature and the relationship of people to each other. And climate change is the failure of these two fundamental relationships. If we love nature deeply enough, we could never have damaged it like this. And if we love people enough, we couldn't damage them. So you can see that, that you know, we talk about greed and all this sort of stuff, but more fundamental than that is the love and the, and the survival, the vibrance of these two relationships that will underpin everything that we do. So that when you go out to buy a new dress, you think to yourself, you know, if I love Mother Nature enough, do I really need a new dress that rips out all this stuff out of the earth and Amazing. uses all this energy and, and then in the end harm ourselves by doing it? We've got to become so much more aware of our impact on the world. The other thing is that, that, you know, a lot of Western countries measure nowadays only their own impact within their country borders and do not measure what they do to other countries. I often talk about how oh. the exploitation is part of damage because if you go to countries like India or Ethiopia and all those places, businessmen are wandering the world looking for cheap labor. And they will pay those countries to manufacture cheap goods for the Western world mm. without environmentally friendly processes because they will not pay for them. Always say you want environmentally friendly goods, pay for it. You know, pay the people who manufacture it, pay them for the processes that make them environmentally friendly. And we'll have both a more equal world in terms of people and nature. Don't they just pass that cost on to the consumer though? Like if you're trying to buy something vegan friendly, you're pretty much guaranteed it's going to be more expensive than the, the alternative. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we are rich countries and we have to look at the pay structure and again look at how much the super rich is taking out even of advanced countries. You know, for example, I've been talking to a taxi driver, a hard working man. He says he doesn't make a bad living. He can't complain. But he says that he longed for having enough money to buy all the green things he would like to buy, but he can't. So we need to, in a way, we talk about minimum wage, but we need to begin to talk about if we really want to be green, a minimum green wage. Mm. It's so interesting, the point you make about these large companies only paying for their whatever carbon footprint in the country in that they operate. I know of a, a massive software giant that we all probably know, who has committed to reversing all of its carbon footprint ever and actually go into a positive state. But I think, Judy, you've opened my eyes here to look into that in more detail to see on what land, in which border, what part of their supply chain are they really taking accountability for? And is that really the impact they're having on the world when we're talking about things on a deep level, such as how we've damaged it and CO2 and things like that? And so I work in the cloud computing space and, and you imagine all of the IT infrastructure we have right now, the internet as we know it, none of that stuff stands up until there are actual data centers, large buildings with using how much electricity and supply and gas and water and all these types of things. And now companies are beginning to ask for the green measures. What's my computational use of this data center? Can I measure a green score? How sustainable am I? And I think with the UN having sustainability in, in one of its top 16, everyone's now talking about this buzzword, sustainability. And I think, Judy, you, you've got some of the answers, right? How do we, what's the single biggest thing an individual can do to minimize their impact on society? You talked about things like every breath we take lingers for how many years? There's almost a debt that needs to be paid from that. What, what can we do? Someone listening to this podcast now thinking, I want to make a change. What can I do? 
We hope you are enjoying this podcast so far. If you would like to help us to invest in ideas that matter, then why don't you become a well-wisher? All you have to do is sign up for our monthly donations via our website, which is vicharmanthan.org. Become a well-wisher, support our work and invest in ideas that matter. Thank you for listening. What, what can we do? Someone listening to this podcast now thinking, you, I want to make a change. What can I do? You have enormous power as consumers. One of them is not to consume so much. And the other thing is to look at the products that you buy and challenge the companies that manufacture them. Find out how they do it, where they are, whether they abuse nature and abuse people. You know, as consumers, if you stop buying a product, well, there's no company, is there? Mm. I mean, it's as simple as that. So you have enormous power to shift these things, especially with goods which are not fundamentally basic to your lives. Okay, food and so on, you cannot escape from buying, but a lot of things you can escape from buying. And that is enormously powerful. And I think this, this equality of thinking and so on, you know, a lot of things change because certain things at certain moments in time in society become a societal trend of being not acceptable. You know, this is very powerful when something is not acceptable. Even the biggest companies are actually touched by this. They're very anxious about their image and so on. When you refuse some, reveal something and find that society is not accepting it, you're in big trouble if you're a company. That's so interesting. And this has to be across the world. You know, you know, you have to look at what people are doing. For example, there are also certain habits that people don't think about. We all like cheap things without thinking. Yeah, right. we want cheap food, we want cheap this, we'll go and buy the cheaper version or something. We need to think about what happens when we buy that cheaper version and why it is so cheap. For example, there's been big publicity for some time, you know, around how they are giving us cheap chicken. Chicken is very popular. Mm. You go to Tesco and so on. And, and for a long time, ch chicken from Tesco was actually related to feeding chickens with soya grown in Brazil and deforesting the place in order that in Britain, we can feed the chicken with soya and make them grow very fast so that we can have them very cheap. And this whole thing, again, science, you know, science has worked out how fast you can grow a chicken so that it reaches a rate of how much it weighs within a certain weeks yes. and it, it pop it and it goes to market. Horrible. But in order for it to grow so fast, you feed it not the food that it usually eats, but things like soya, which it doesn't usually eat. Chickens don't usually eat soya beans. Uh, and then like there's, they've got like third legs and it's disgusting, like the chicken farming horrible. And the legs, if they if you don't top them and bring them to market at that point at which they're supposed to be sold and they keep growing, their legs actually fracture because they're too heavy. Okay, to this them. is a difficult lesson for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But it's the reality and we have to face it and we have to change society to not do things like that. That's disgusting. It is. And that's just touching the surface. Yes. We, we must make a change, Judy. And we thank you for the contributions you've made. You know, the fact that you've been awarded and pioneered such movements um, is amazing. And we're very grateful that, that you're joining us on the podcast today. Let's, let's, uh, let's go into the rapid fire round. I don't know if you've heard the podcast before, but we have this thing called rapid fire round. I'm going to ask you a, a quick set of questions. I hope you enjoy them. Judy, what goes into your perfect breakfast smoothie? <laughs> I don't make smoothies. Smoothies, for one thing, uses a machine and a machine uses energy. Uh, I, should I, just, I just peel a perfectly wrapped banana. Awesome. And uh, and have cereal with soya milk because I'm vegan. Very nice. Great answer. <laughs> if you were stranded, oh, this is this is a great question for you, actually. If you were stranded on a desert island, what three things would you take with you and why? I would like a little bag of seeds of my favorite food. <laughs> nice. And hopefully the climate on my tropical island will allow me to grow them. 
You are you are truly sustainable, even at the, at the <laughs> thinking layer. I love it. This is great. Yeah, and I would like books of poetry. I think that one has to feed oneself spiritually and aesthetically. And then the third, if I were privileged to do so, I would like to really have a small pet animal of some kind. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, and what would that pet be? What animal would you like? I would like a rabbit. Although you know, uh, you know, historically rabbits have been made very destructive environmentally. <laughs> so you have to really control that rabbit. <laughs> I, uh, okay, you shattered my illusions of a cute little bunny rabbit. And I've got this, uh... Well, if you allow it to breed and it went into the wild, then, then as you know, rabbits really breed and they have devastated whole landscapes. <laughs> Attack of the rabbits. But that, that's also part of the balance of nature. Like, it it's is. not all sunshine and rainbows. The stark reality is it, it, it's a destructive place. I guess it's the, you know, Brahma, Vishnu, Bahesh, creation, preservation and destroying. There is that understanding in nature. Yeah, using science to understand nature and, and respecting that over these millions of years, we develop what we call ecosystems. Mm. So when you bring alien things into particular ecosystems, you can really disturb and then destroy them. The rabbit was one of them. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, what would you say is your favorite book? My favorite book. I see you have a, an entire library behind you. I know. It's, I don't think about favorite books as well. <laughs> okay, a, a recommended book. If you were to recommend a book to someone. Book. Um, to the listeners of the Vijar Month and Podcast, what book do you recommend we read? There's a remarkable storyteller, probably the most masterful storyteller of our time is someone called Martin Shaw. Okay. And he wrote a book called A Branch of the Lightning Tree. Okay. Is that a wonderful title? That is very descriptive. And it's all about stories, mythology and their meanings and how to creatively use them in your life. Awesome. Okay. Judy, you've, you've, amassed a lot of wisdom and seen a lot of the world and are trying to make societal impact i, I for one salute you um but what is the best piece of advice or wisdom that you've been given one of the things people don't realize sometimes from all the great books you know all the great books of uh you call them religion or whatever you want to call them in the West, but they are great books of wisdom, including the Bible, the Quran, and all the Hindu books, all the Buddhist books, and so on. But if you read them deeply, they are all about love. Hmm. And, the, and one thing people might not realize, for example, in the Christian one, which says, uh, love your neighbor as thyself. One of the things they don't realize about that challenge is that it's actually a challenge to love yourself because mm. you cannot love your neighbor well as thyself until you love yourself well. For sure. And loving yourself is actually one of the biggest challenge on our spiritual journeys. It is very difficult. It involves a lot of healing, involve facing up to lots and lots of things before you can fully love yourself and therefore love others well. And I think what we were talking about earlier about environmental impact, societal impact, all these kind of things, you definitely made reference there of one's own environment, their inner environment, and how that alone will make a massive impact on how we impact the outer world. So if we loved ourselves enough, we loved each other enough and we were trying to build something sustainable for us together disastrous impact we would have on nature would also be minimized absolutely if you just look at a single item like food if you truly love yourselves everything you ate you would scrutinize it for what you are putting into your body before you know it you're completely environmental yeah 
you know you wouldn't have anything that's grown with massive pesticides you wouldn't have contaminated food you wouldn't want all the plastics that are going in there you wouldn't want any into your water we're drinking water with with plastic in it now because it's so ground down and so on. so all these things when you're conscious even at that simple level of taking care of your body you will become environmental you know, one of the things we have is in, in all our lives, and it's a natural, we aspire to have a better life. And one of the things that the developing countries in the world look to the West as a model of what a better life would be. We have a huge responsibility because we're consuming in such a way that with the American model, if the developing countries want to live like the Americans, we need five planet Earths and we don't have it. So one of the things the West is being challenged to do in terms of sustainability is that we have to look for a model of life that is a one planet living. What does one planet living mean? It means getting a lot of the rubbish, the things we produce that are built in disposable things and so on to create a life that preserves nature and yet is a good life so that the world can aspire to that good life that does not damage the planet. It's a huge challenge. Brilliant. That, the way you put that is amazing. And I, for one, am certainly going to start to look at the world with more of an awareness of how I impact it. I think we've ended the rapid fire round. Um, <laughs> you've given me food for thought on, on another level. Why do you think a sustainable society is something we should aim towards? If you look at the word sustainable, it basically means staying alive. So are we not doing that? Are we no, damaging? No, we're not saying, first of all, we are harming ourselves in many ways. We don't harm ourselves to such a great extent that it is too obvious, but we are harming ourselves with our Western, Western ways of living. And we, we need to really remodel our lives in order for it to, to be so-called sustainable and not harm ourselves. Is there a model that you know that exists that we could start to work on? There are parts of it in, in, different, in different parts of the world, but we need to remember always that where there are isolated models and you're trying to adapt it to a kind of world model, you must realize that first of all, we, we're in the 21st cent century and we need to have models of lives coming together and creating a new model. For example, we do have lives that are very sustainable, which are actually very hard lives, but they're sustainable. Mm -hmm. Like the people, the Kogi people in the high Sierra mountains in, in South America. They live completely isolated and they have come actually into the coastal areas and seen what the world has done to the world and so on. And they've actually come with messages and saying, you are destroying the world and, and you are our brothers, please listen to us. And then they go back into the mountains and they do not copy anything that we do. They, they live very frugally. They live with with the pleasure of community and family at this core. They don't buy lots of things or anything like that. They live off the, off the land and the land can still support them. But even such lifestyles, you have to understand, if it's disturbed by massive climate change, even they might not be able to maintain it. But they have lessons about what is valuable that makes us truly happy, which some of us have learned through the COVID experience. Because mm. many people were in lockdown, not allowed to go out or theater, football, buy things, all sorts of things like that. They found that what kept them happy was their good relationships with their family For and sure. with their community. So we are having a kind of rediscovery where we say, let's make the core of everything about being human and not destroy nature and have a different form of life. That is such a beautiful message. And I agree throughout the pandemic, we have become more aware of our impact on society. What do we need really to be sustainable or be happy? And it's been quite a journey for a lot of people. I, for one, um, rediscovered my wardrobe. I was just, you know, taking, <laughs> taking uh, honestly, taking stock check of, how many clothes I have and have actually made a commitment and I'm not afraid to say this live on air to the entire world <laughs> on a podcast but 
I have committed to not buying any clothes for an entire year. Now, that sounds so silly, and there's probably people that haven't done that for a long time, but I just was totally unaware of how many, for example, t-shirts I have. I don't know what the number is, but then I think about not just me, but people I know and people in society regularly go shopping and buy clothes, like all the time, almost habitually. That's crazy. I'm totally unsustainable. So I, I've made that one small commitment. And I encourage anyone on the podcast as well to listen to the podcast to make a similar commitment if you can, or, or email in with commitments that you make that make you more sustainable. Um, and you can email those in at podcast at vicharmanthan.org. I think another challenge I can give you on top of that Go is when you don't buy those clothes and you have enough to eat, you're quite all right in your ordinary life and so on, what will you do with the money you save? I am going to donate it. Yes, wonderful. You see, this is where we can begin to practice more collective living, where we actually look across the world and locally to see who it is whose lives can be transformed by what we do with our extra money. Because so many in this, this is what I mean by a rich country, that so many of us with so-called ordinary level lives, actually, if we look at it, we do have quite a lot of spare money, not phenomenal mm. amount, but quite a lot. And collectively, we're enormously powerful in changing the circumstances of other people's lives. And if we do that, we are a force. For sure. And you're right there about money and wealth. You know, the, one of the five pillars of society, um, as previously discussed on Vichar Manthan's Sustainable Narratives Conference in 2020, wealth was one of those core pillars. And we ran an entire Vichar Manthan, an entire series just on wealth and looking at sustainable wealth and are there other wealth systems that we can be a part of, not just the one we're in, you know, in this credit and debit system that we have in, in the West. Um, and how damaging that is actually to people's lives, their mental well-being, capitalism, commercialism, and then the larger impact that has on society. So anyone listening in, I encourage you to go onto the Vijay Month and website or, or YouTube and have a look at the Sustainable Narratives Conference from 2020, and especially in the wealth section. There was an entire series run on wealth. Um, I encourage you to look at that. Um, and actually, Judy, you asked the question, what will I do with that extra money? We've actually had an episode on the VM podcast um, called Sustainable Contributions, in which we talk about an organization called the Earth Charitable Foundation. And they've got a thing set up called the 1% Club. So as, as young professionals or professionals living and earning money in London and in England, we should easily be able to give up 1% of our wealth to uh, um, a foundation that's looking at sustaining the earth and living by sustainable dharmic principles and values just a cheeky plug there i think that's very good i mean i mean in terms of cheeky plugs i got another one myself <laughs> love it let's hear it because through friends and colleagues you know one gets in touch with people run little organizations across the world and i'm in touch with one called the Jenness foundation in nairobi working in the slums paying school fees and and helping very poor children to have enough to eat and having basic clothing and, and things like that. And they've hit the crisis because their usual donors have been really hit by COVID. Mm. So they're having a crisis and I myself been trying to, among my colleagues and friends, again saying, you know, what's 10 pounds to you? You know, if there's a couple of hundred of us giving 10 pounds, we'll pull this organization out of this crisis. With hardly any. And it's that collective effort that makes the difference, yes. right? Just one person donating or being charitable or trying to minimize their impact on humanity, society is one thing for sure. But it's when we can spread these ideas and influence other people to make more informed decisions. Um, yes. That yes. gets the ball rolling. Yes, absolutely. Collectively, we are very powerful. I want to talk a little bit more about this spiritual journey and healing one can do that helps with all of these problems is there a do you are you aware of what those biggest challenges are internally i think that one of 
the biggest things that hold us back from doing things is that society, a society that doesn't guarantee caring for its people, instills terrific fear and insecurity in individuals. So that, for example, like you, you say, you know, we talk about giving and all this sort of stuff as a good principle and so on. And yet lots of people have lots of money in their bank and do not give it away because they are frightened. They think this is my security. If I gave it away, will people take care of me when I need yeah, it? Yeah, that yeah. is the big question. So there's this facing up to to the fear in insecurity of giving, I think, is a is the big, big thing for society. I, I like the way you put that with society and actually thinking about how we operate and some of those governance models we have within like what happens to you when you retire and you know in the UK we have a lot of elderly care homes yeah you know does that work is that nice and people have this fear that they won't be looked after so they keep this money and then that money doesn't get put to good use and that's not sustainable either can no. we create a society where money isn't the central theme if we were wise enough as a society to pool our money or, or let's not call it money let's call it wealth well you see i like to go back a little somehow sometimes if you look a little bit further into the past you can have perhaps some kind of answers and one of them is building community mm. for example you know when you go to Scotland or Wales, where the population is small and so on, they still have a lot of very established real communities. In England, it's much more fragmented. And, and I have friends who come from, from India. I remember one friend a long time ago, we were talking about something, and he says, I come from the poorest state in India, Bihar. And he says, I can tell you that in terms of community, we are superior. Wow. Because he says that a lot of people in the West do not understand what village India is. And this was many decades ago. I don't know what village India is like now, decades later. But at that time, he says, in the villages I know in Bihar, you cannot starve. You can only starve if you are an outcast in the village. Because if you need a job, no matter how simple or how how you know difficult it is and so someone in the village will find you a job it might not be the best job you want but they will find you a job since villages take care of each other this is the tradition and if the whole village starve it's because there's a drought and famine famine you do not starve alone you starve together that is a village wow how wholesome that warm, but that then there were also heart. smaller communities and and even in this country i've seen something of that in the more you know poorly populated parts of scotland and wales again that smaller community taking care of each other and so on is still a model that means that you know in 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 London as well, you have all these things like um, organizations which are about befriending and going to to visit an old person who lives completely alone and has nobody and so on. That doesn't happen in the village. Mm, you don't need that. Yeah, because you know the old person. You can never have an old person of completely left alone. But we, this is happening in our broken societies. So even in our societies, we need to begin to to take care of each other. For example, there's another community I know, a particular, and again, like, like in Christianity, you have, you know, Baptist and you have Methodist and all sorts of variations. And apparently there's this one variation of a Islamic small community. And they have all these rules of taking care of people. I remember on one occasion, there was a young couple and they had no relatives for whatever reason. That was their, their reality. They had no relatives. There was just the two of them. They were very happily married and so on. And suddenly the man died and the, the woman was left completely alone. Well, because they were part of that community, one of their rules is that when that happens, for the first 14 days, that person is never left alone. They put up a router in which someone stayed in that little flat with the young woman 
day and night for 14 days. Mm. That's powerful. And I, a lot, I've seen a lot of that through, through the Indic civilization, community-based efforts around important events such as birth, death, and, and weddings, yes. and, and all sorts, just part of the fabric of your life. And I think you're right about if you look at in dense London somewhere or, or a major city, you've got people living completely isolated. And I think the yes. pandemic highlighted that further, you know, yes. people living, breathing, eating in one space and not. Yeah, they were all becoming people. mentally ill because they yeah. can't go out and uh, completely alone. Big problems that we face and we've got to start from the inside, but also be aware of that outer impact that we make. Scaling sustainable society. That's a challenge I think we all face together. Well, you know, we come back to the beginning, don't we? When when we first started, what I talk about as an integrated approach to sustainability, that there's no such thing as a purely environmental project. A so-called purely environmental project is one that has neglected its social, cultural and economic dimensions. And from what we've been speaking about, you can see how true it is. It penetrates every area of our life. Fascinating conversation today here with Judy Ling Wong on the Vichara Mountain podcast. And we're very grateful to, to have, have you on and to share this wisdom with us. And you've certainly opened my eyes and hopefully our listeners at home as to how important, as to how important it is to think about our social impact, our cultural impact, environmental and economic concerns. It's a wholesome approach. And we are the ones that need to solve some of the challenges going forward in society, or at least influence those around us to do similar things. Judy, um, thank you very much for joining us here today. One final question. What one piece of wisdom or advice can you offer our listeners as to how to live more sustainably? Learn how to take care of yourselves. You will learn all about being environmental. Brilliant. That journey starts from within. Again, this was the Vichara Mantham podcast. Very grateful to have all our listeners tune in from all around the world. Be safe, be sustainable, and think about your impact on society. My name is Sumit Sharma. This was the VM podcast. Namaste. Mm -hmm.